have to literally garbage collection everything that I have declared. Otherwise, the language, the language itself doesn't know. Well, like C. C makes you uh, request memory and then delete the memory. Yeah. Does JavaScript have a garbage collector? It must Automatic. Have. It must have. Yeah. It and it, it pretty much all interpreted languages do. So, in fact, I actually wouldn't even call it automatic garbage collection in JavaScript. It, it's probably something else because the memory is faked by the interpreter itself. You kind of have like a layer that sits above it um, where any high-level language modernly would have automatic garbage collection. Java is even weirder since Java abstracts memory because it runs in a virtual machine. So, it's actually the virtual machine's fake memory that we're creating these things. So the virtual machine has a garbage collector that goes through and cleans up virtual machine memory. And then, you know, who, whatever language the virtual machine was written in was probably C or C++. It had to delete its own memory for the people who wrote the, the JVM. You know, kind of two different levels there. I read a paper about the garbage collection of JavaScript and it talks about all the it's performance very well when you don't using more than uh, forty percent of the memory. As JavaScript as, or Java? JavaScript. As long as it's above fifty percent, the garbage collection become really in, in, say it take a very long time to get the memory efficiently running. Well, yeah, because the, the then the footprint. See, the JavaScript runs inside of an interpreter. Yeah. So if you are using that much RAM, then what ultimately is happening is, that we, that's what I was saying, is that the gar garbage collection would actually work differently inside of an interpreter than it would in a high level language where you're actually directly working with true RAM, let's say. Um, so what ends up happening is, is that uh, memory in a interpreter like JavaScript is represented as probably an array. And if you start using a lot of memory, that means that array is huge. Yeah. So going through and checking the elements in that array starts getting slow. Yeah. It's going to be slower, and the more buckets you have to check, the slower it's going to get. Yeah, the person you say running the benchmark and uh, just giving, say, the efficiency becomes getting down really yeah. significant if you're getting more and more memory used. All right, so we have now updated our first part here to uh, let him know he can release registers when he's done because we've already done our part, and, but this is our, our new magical piece here. So we'll, uh, oh, that we already put a little comment. So the var name has been associated with a mem location, so we can now release the register name. All right, so this is our, this is our special sauce here in uh, this chunk of code. We've, we've built our output string, so we have fancy smancy looking uh, assembly code. But at the end of the day, we now have the value associated with a uh, memory location or a, ver a var name associated with a memory location. Um, and we've given our register back so that somebody else can use it if they need it. All right. So now if we're in this else, we're going to have to update this else here shortly because now we're going to be dealing with other kinds of assignment operators. But before we get to that, we'll just leave it as an else because our uh, compiler right now only supports two separate states. Right? It supports the state of defining a variable and then giving that variable a value. Okay, so, and we'll actually probably just modify the second state for um, this next piece. All right, so for this part, if we go back into our example in here, this is where we're giving it a value. So right off the bat, we can load into um, a register, our um, value, but we're also going to need to get a, uh, the re we're going to have to load into register the address associated with my variable name. Yeah, you have the, uh, right? Uh, so right here I have my variable name. I don't have this information necessarily right now, this T0 information. I don't necessarily have that. I need that. All right, so I need to load into T0 a memory address given its name. So let's just start off by, we'll just do that right here in the first part. We'll say int location is equal to this dot, the data memory, get um, uh, 
Let's get address for new memory. Did I not? I, oh, I did this for registers, not data memory yet. All right. So let's see. Where's my data memory? Get address for new memory. Set var, blah, blah, blah. Get value given var name. Okay. So I need to get address given var name. Yep. So we're going to write a function here. All right, and this is going to be for mem bucket mb in this dot the buckets if mb dot um, realistically, if we're really writing this correctly, we should say if it's in use and if that's true and mb dot get var name equals. dot equals var name. And probably checking that using you should be quicker because checking pulling is much quicker than Correct. the string. Yep. So if both those things are true, if the current mem bucket is a used bucket, something is stored there. Great. Now it's worth exploring more. What are we going to ask? Is the variable name associated with that guy equal to the variable name we're looking for? Keeping in mind that the default variable name for a mem bucket is the empty string. So the empty string would not match a variable name. So this only works if we actually did associate a variable name with that, uh, uh, with that mem bucket. Okay. So if it's currently in use and it matches our variable name, then what do I want to do? I want to return MB dot get location. Otherwise we will throw a runtime exception. Could yeah, did you did it right there? Couldn't find mem location that did oh, throw new runtime exception there we go all right so get address given var name um, I'll give this guy the variable name he'll hunt through and he's ultimately going to give me the memory address associated with uh, that guy because I'm going to need that memory address all right so we'll go back in here I have my location so this is get address given var name. All right, so now I need to get my var name out of this guy. And my var name is going to be the first part of my split, right? Yep. So I actually, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at var name here like this. I'm gonna move this to a different place farther down. Um, So we're going to say string var name is equal to parts uh, at bucket zero dot trim. So if we think about that, if this is my instruction right now, and I split this on the equal sign, the first part will be these X space. If I take that and I trim it, I'm left with just an X. That's my var name. So I have my var name, and then I'm going to say, give me the location associated with that var name. All right, so now I have a memory location. All right, makes sense? Yep. Next thing we need, though, is we are going to need um, the uh, register that we're going to put that memory location in. We need the equivalent of this T0 here because we don't necessarily know it's T0 in our little world now. We did know when these guys were back to back, but since they're not necessarily back to back, I need to go ahead and look up the um, address of variable name um, and associate that with a register. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna ask our data memory for a new register. So we're gonna say string, um, destination register say something like that this dot the register collection dot get next available register 
Um, oh, I'm actually giving it as for a var name too, even though that's not overly important. Yep. Well, it's not inaccurate here. It's just we didn't really actually need it. Or you can just create a new method. What's this? Oh, I thought that was going to. Oh, this minimizes it. There we go. All right. So here's my destination register. I'm going to go ahead and ask my register collection for the next available register where. If these guys were right next to each other, it would be the register that I just released. That's the next available one. So I would get T0 again in the event that these guys were literally right next to each other. All right, so I have my destination register now. Why are we passing the bar name to get next to zero for register name? Uh, because that's how we kept track in registers last time of, <laughs> this is, we, we doing it, we're doing it two separate times. This time we're keeping track of variable names associated with data memory. Yeah. Last time we kept track of um, registers associated with variable names. Yeah, but I mean like, because we had two different methods. We had the one, the get register with variable name and get register with name. For data memory today. That's probably the better way of doing it. Well, I meant just both for register. Like um, we had those two separate ones for register. We had those two separate ones for um, mem bucket. I mean, like, if, so if you look in register collection, we had two different method methods. So there's the uh, get register name by var name, and then I thought there was yeah. Okay, so for get next available register name. Oh, I, I see what you're asking. Yeah. So oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So we could implement this differently. What we're doing is we're getting a two for one deal. I'm saying, look, I need another register and that register happens to be a register I'm gonna associate with a variable name. So I'm gonna ask for that register, giving you that variable name so that when you get it, when you find an available register, so that is when we find a, the next register that's not in use, what will I do? I'm going to set it to be in use, and then I'll also let him know that he's now associated with that variable name. Okay. And we've already written the release for that. So Correct. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. We're technically only setting the variable name for a register for like a brief moment before we store it in data memory again. Yeah, in, in this particular case. Okay. But the point is we don't always use registers for variable names. Yeah. We just happen to be using it for variable names here. And last class, we wrote it specifically for working with variable names because that's what the assignment was. So we could rewrite this and say, well, we don't always need registers when we have variable names. So it might make sense to get the next available register. And then since it was being used for a variable name, then we would choose to set the variable name for that register. But this works fine for now, at least until we get to something where it actually breaks. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we'll go ahead and get our destination register. This is the name of that register. It's not an actual register, it's the name of the register. Um, but we know that this is a register that's not currently being used for anything. And if it did happen to have, happen in sequential order here, where we had just done our definition of X, and then I said, I need the next register for X, it would give us the T0 we would get the same register name again because the the only thing that's happened between us releasing it and now is us asking for it again. Nothing else has occurred in there. But if I had a hundred lines of code where all sorts of other things have happened, it's entirely possible we've handed out registers left and right and the next register available is T12 or something like that. In which case, that's not a big deal that will just change what we actually put in here. This will give me the name of that thing being T12 because that is the next, that was the register I associated with my location. All right, so what I have in my code right now is I have the location of my variable name. So I, we're doing an assignment operator. So we're doing this thing right here, like this X is equal to seven. I'm saying I have a variable name named X. Presumably, this guy has a storage location in memory somewhere. Otherwise, this is a syntax error. Okay, we're not really checking for syntax errors at this point, but so we can assume it's properly written code. X has a home in memory somewhere. Okay, because we've, we've defined it previously. 
So I'm going to say I want to ask my data memory to let me know where, what the location is for X. That's effectively what's happening there. And that's going to give me that location. All right. Then we're going to say, go ahead and give me a fresh new destination register that I can use for, uh, uh, well, that, that I can put stuff in, whatever stuff I'm going to do. I happen to mark it as my variable name, but I'm actually not even going to use that ability um, for it. Okay. Uh, in fact, this very uh, this ability isn't even needed anymore because of the way we're doing the second part. But we'll just leave it like we like we just said. All right. So now I have my memory address, which should be by this example five thousand. I should have five thousand stored in location, and I should have t something stored in the register. In our example here, it would be t zero. All right. So now what I need to do is I need to go ahead and do this add to that register zero Again. the address. I need to output this as code. Because what this did up above was wrote out assembly code that assumed that you were going to immediately give it a value on the very next line. But that's not a requirement in high level coding, right? Mm -hmm. We could define a variable then do our life's work and then finally give that variable the number seven. And a lot can happen in the middle. So we can go ahead and what this line effectively did, it's not a waste of time, this first line, because what this first line did is it, it carved out a little place in data memory for us to store that variable named X whenever we're ready to give it a value, all right? But now we're, we finally arrived at the moment when we actually want to give it a value. So I kind of need the register again in order for this thing to, for this thing to work. For me to do this, uh, this store, mm -hmm. the store requires me to have a register as the, have the memory address loaded in a register. So I'm going to need to output, I need this add I thing again with my register name, and my uh, memory address. So we're going to learn a little something about what we did today. So this stuff right here, um, let's see, so we're gonna have add I, uh, we already have a var name, we already have a reg name. All right, well, let's just steal it. This is actually kind of a junky way of doing it, but eh, move on with life. So we're going to do an add i, then we have our destination register, and then zero. So this is instead of being reg name, this is called destination register, and then zero, and then we have our location. Yeah, one second. Uh, which if? The first one, just want to see why it's not printing three times if it's just like this. Hmm? Three well, you, you this this is the if you're looking at? Yeah. It will yeah. print to twice, technically. It will? You, you mean this line? This line here? Yeah. It will. It'll it do that will. twice. Oh, okay. Now it will. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So bottom line is, is that we can say that this is um, even less efficient assembly code. But it's not inaccurate assembly code. It's not correct. Yeah, because nothing hurts me from saying um, add I T zero zero five thousand, and on the very next line doing the exact same thing, overwriting T zero with a five thousand. It looks dumb, but it gives us the flexibility now of doing something more than than what, than what the book was indicating. The book basically has shown us examples where you define a variable and immediately give it a value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. Now, you might even say that most of the time that's what we do anyways. Most of the time when we uh, have variables, we uh, give it, uh, you know, we, we actually put it in one line, int x equals 7. That's common, but it's not the only way that's allowed. All right, so ours is a little bit truer to life right now. Um, 
But to your point, it will do it twice. <laughs> it's not a problem. It's, it's stuttering is, is, is what it's doing. It, there's a room for optimization. <laughs> significant. A significant room. But do keep in mind, and this is, I think, what is really interesting about teaching and learning about this stuff today versus 30 years ago, let's say. It's just the exact same material, but the way we perceive it is different. 30, 40 years ago, your question about having this thing happen twice, I mean, that's a dire situation. Like, look, you are doing things more than once and we don't have time for that. This is a slow processor. We only have eight registers, you know, whatever it is. That's not the world we live in now. Heck, do it nine times in a row. We're not going to notice. Wait a second. But at the time, I think make it more efficient for register is more important than today. Well, but back then we had multiple enemies. True. We had a limit, limited number of registers. Limited we had a limited amount, amount of memory. Man. And our processors weren't as fast. Yeah. You know, now, you know, this laptop, we have a Core i5. I7. I7. So yeah, but she has a quad core processor. This thing can do four things at once. Technically can do eight things at once with hyper threading. Okay. And it can probably do something in the ballpark of two plus billion instructions per second per core. This is one extra instruction. <laughs> Invisible. It can do billions per second. <laughs> We're not going to notice, right? So I mean, it's, it's fascinating from a computer science perspective just how much things have changed. Things that we used to care a lot about, we don't care about at all now. You know, we see that in our high level languages. When was the last time you defined a variable of type short? Yeah. They exist. In Java, I can create a variable of type short. I can say, I can come in here and I can say uh, short x is equal to 45. Who uses shorts? Kind of values that fit in shorts. This is negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. Uh, uh, so if I put 32,767 in here, it's happy. But if I put 32,768 in here, it's not happy. Just a little <laughs> bit too big. Short. Didn't quite fit in his shorts. The, the <laughs> type of the shorts. Okay. I also have a question. I think at the, your time, do you learn the assembly first? Say you learn the base, the lower programming first, then you learn the higher, or it's like today? Um, I don't know. I'm, well, because I, I, I have to answer it two different ways. I taught myself high-level programming first. Mm -hmm. um, I started coding when I was nine. So I didn't have access to somebody who could teach me assembly. Uh, then I, you know, I started just typing stuff in from a book mm -hmm. and seeing it work and then tinkering yeah. with it. But in school, I think, I think we learned high-level first. Your high-level first? Yeah, but I mean, the classes were pretty quick, you know, if it was high level first, it was a semester apart or something, because they're very different. I mean, learning low level versus high level, I mean, you're, if I think about an assignment I would give you in a normal, well, okay, well, let's just look at this assignment, right? So this assignment was probably fairly challenging. We haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. I mean, we're, we're upgrading our compiler as we're going through it, so we're actually making this substantially a bigger deal than it was for the assignment um, because we're making it more real to life, let's say. But the point is, is that giving this to you in the, the realm of it's a high level language that you're writing the solution in, in Java, let's call this a difficult but reasonable assignment. If I said write this in assembly, that's, that's no longer a reasonable assignment. That's terrible. Because <laughs> every one of these lines is like, you know, 30 assembly instructions. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, drop the class. That's that's an unreasonable assignment for a week. It's one of those things you maybe work on for like a year, and it's like your kind of weird manifesto. <laughs> you're like, yeah, I wrote this entire thing in assembly, and people just look at you like, why? <laughs> it's like, well, because I can. 
you know, basically the whole, <laughs> big, big, it's basically the same argument of why I'm going to get somebody writing the entire book of uh, Leviticus on parchment. <laughs> somebody is going to do that. And they're going to be like, well, did you even need the... I'm not I, kidding. I'm looking forward to it. Giant but the point giant. is that's one of those things that you would have just... I know, I get it. I want all this stuff like documented with pictures and stuff, like the whole process of going through this. It was just one of those things like, just to have that story and say, look, I was in college, I was in a grad class, and I my teacher made this like joke replacement assignment. And I wrote the book of Leviticus by hand <laughs> on parchment. <laughs> well, why would you do that? Well, he gave it as an option. <laughs> it was an option for points. So it's, yeah. Kind of back to what she was saying, mm -hmm. because I'm a little lost. So she, if I understood this correctly, so she was saying that that if statement on line 31 would be printing out that line twice. It's this, it, forget about the if statement. Okay. Her, what she's asking is that before we have two different forms of expressions, we have defining a variable, giving a variable a value. Okay. So what she's saying is, is that if you defined a variable and then gave it a value like we have here, our output now would not be identical to this output. Our output would have this first line twice. Because we do it once for this first thing here, yeah. but then when we get to the second line and we get into that else, we actually do it again. Because we are not, we do it again right here. Let me get rid of this short thing. Right there. And we're doing it again because in this code, we no longer make the assumption that this instruction came right after this instruction. Gotcha. Okay. We're now saying you can put anything in between these. But if they did happen to come right after each other, you would have this exact line twice. But if it, it just will be one of the extra instructions, one of the extra billion instructions that happens that second. But now if these guys did not come next to each other, this line might not appear in there twice. Because this line would look at look like T0 in one place, and then later on it might be T4 or something like that. Whatever register we found that was currently available. It would still be the memory address 5000, because that's what we've associated X with. X is memory address 5000. We need some available register to put that into when we actually go to do this part, to set the value. All right. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand that same professor and everything, and I, I see that's like a lot of jobs out there, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not a lot, but some, yeah. Why some of these companies want people that works with assembly still, if we have all this hardware that is faster? Well, so... Uh, so let's let's rework that question instead of focusing on an individual job let me just give you a real life example of when assembly is still important so the example i always go to is like with video games you know so a majority of a video game you can write in a high level language like c c plus plus something like that and you don't need to go in and do anything crazy because most of your video games are your computer your graphics card all that stuff is fast enough to play that game as fast as a human being is going to notice. But every now and then, you get to some part of that game that has to be really, really, really fast. And sometimes high-level languages, similar to our situation uh, where we had some of these like runtime exceptions we've thrown in here. Yeah, similar to like this kind of stuff. We might know for a fact that this line will never happen. Okay. Now, with a high-level language like Java, the compiler is going to say, look, I don't know what you know as a human being. So as far as I'm concerned, you've told me you will return a string and you might not return a string in here. So I'm not happy with you. Now, as a programmer, we might know, we might say, look, if we don't find the value in here, the program's crashing. 
that's an impossibility. Blue screen of death is our example, right? Okay. If it tries to look up a memory address and it has a fault, a page fault, and doesn't get that memory address, OS is coming down. All right. There's no comfortable way of getting at something zigged when it should have zagged. So as a programmer, we might say, okay, Java, the high level language is forcing me to write some extra stuff here. And that extra stuff is translating into extra lines of assembly. All right. So now let's say that we're dealing with a, you know, a wall of assembly here that is in a portion of the program that is really has to be really, really, really fast. As the programmer, we might say, we know that this part of this assembly will never occur, but it's in there. So we might go in and we might take that out. And then we might go up and edit the assembly up here and say, well, we're technically asking a question here, but that question is a waste of time. I know that the answer will always be this. So I'm gonna remove that question. Now all of a sudden you slide right through that assembly like it's you know light speed because you're not asking questions. You're just doing nine instructions in a row, whatever they are. You better just hope that it you know everything the, the moons align or whatever. But what that ends up translating into is that one part of the game that needs to be really 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 fast doesn't have any extraneous logic around it. When a high level language, regardless of how good the compiler was, would have produced additional assembly code that wasn't necessary. So that would just be an example. If you have any application, games would be a reasonable ex uh, example where a part of it, usually it's a very small part, but very a very important part, needs to be really fast. It might make sense to go in and look at the assembly code that's output by a compiler and make some adjustments. Very rarely, I would think today, unless you're working well let's let's just start with the, the the top level statement very rarely today do i think you would sit down and write assembly code from scratch um not that you couldn't but i think more often than not if you were writing assembly you would be doctoring up existing assembly that was outputted from a uh, uh a compiler that may or may not had your you know that may or may not have had all of the the logic in it um that you needed you know might have put extra stuff that you actually didn't need but that was your option with the language that was written in um now having said that when might you write assembly from scratch in today's world well we kind of a, and it's making a comeback now uh there's a i've, I've taught a course on this before called it's a course on embedded systems so um, when I say embedded systems, you know what that means? What, is that, what does that mean to you, an embedded system? It's all based on the chip. Yeah, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's called system on a chip. So an embedded system might be uh, a, a, a whole computer that is a lot smaller than this. And if it's going to be a lot smaller than this, chances are it's a lot less powerful than this. Now we're kind of going back that 30 or 40 years when we're not doing a billion instructions per second or two billion instructions per second. We're doing more like four or 500 instructions per second. You know, it might be for a much simpler type of, uh, um, a simpler type of uh, item. So maybe you have an embedded processor for an embedded system for like a dishwasher, you know, that knows how to do the seven or eight things the dishwasher knows how to do with the various cycles with pots and pans and, yeah, yeah, or your toaster. Yeah, yeah, you got your, your toasters. Um, so one thing you may have heard of, have you heard of uh, CNC programming? Um, so like place a, our robot, the a robotic arm that we have down there, we're going to start incorporating it in some of our classes. Hopefully I bring it into, um, what are the grad classes next semester? Uh, we have, oh, I have to figure out what the topic is going to be for the research class. At the very least, we're going to split it into two so it'll be research and then something else but we'll probably try to do something with the robotic arm in there um, but it uses a programming language that starts looking similar to assembly um, because you're you're having to do little tiny movements with it so the the if you're working with embedded systems or, or significantly lower powered machines 
uh, it's probably going to be more common for you to have to manipulate assembly or even write assembly directly. Similar to our assignment, what, two or three weeks ago when I had you write that assembly program that read in a couple of things and did some stuff with them, all, you know, all that stuff. Um, you might be writing assembly directly for that particular processor if there isn't either a compiler for that architecture, if it's some you know, Bob's chip or something like that, you know, the embedded, the company that makes the embedded system ordered their processors from some company that just makes this very tiny special purpose risk processor for dishwashers. You know, they're just in the market for that. That's what they do. And that's actually places where you'll still find MIPS processors. This MIPS architecture for embedded systems is still a, a thing. You know, they used to drive full computers back when, you know, this was fast. Now, this isn't fast enough anymore, but it's fast enough for a dishwasher or for a toaster or something like that. So some of our 40-year-old problems are modern problems for embedded systems. I think that's kind of maybe a long-winded answer to your question, but... No, no, I understand. Just, um, so if I, if a company decides to create a new processor, the assembly code for that processor is gonna change something like the LW full holes, or if, it, if it, the, the new processor can come, for example, with a division function. Mm -hmm. so, sure. So then it has some um, change whenever a new processor is created. It has change on the assembly code or no. Well, yeah. So, I mean, you have multiple levels there. So that goes back to what we talked about earlier in the course. And you have, yeah, so you have the architecture. This is how the processor, these are the magic tricks the processor knows how to do. Now, you're then going to have the low-level language, the assembly language that is able to, has the one-to-one -one relationship with those magic tricks. So if you have a new architecture, you will have a new assembly language. You might base that assembly language on a known assembly language. Like, for instance, if you look at MIPS, and you look at Intel-based assembly, and you look at RISC um, uh, assembly, or ARM, rather, ARM assembly, they look very similar. You know, you're still doing the same, like, big moves. You're still loading things from RAM into registers. You're storing things from a register into RAM. You're doing mathy stuff. Um, so you're doing the same kinds of things, just the little symbols you put out there might look a little bit different between the... The two, so it's the difference between Java, C Sharp, and uh, Swift, or something like that. If you look at a Hello World program, or you look at you know a program that does something relatively simple in any language, you can see a lot of similarities, even though the actual syntax is a little bit different. The real challenge will be with a brand new architecture: is how long will it take for somebody to come up with a compiler? Because what job does the compiler, so right now we're writing this, what job does the compiler let us do? So if we were to put it into our notes, um, oh, I'm already on it. What problem? does the compiler solve for humans? Now I'm asking a different question. I'm not asking what does a compiler do? A compiler converts high level code into low level code. That's what it does. What I'm asking here is what specific problem does the compiler solve for human beings? Why did we invent compilers in the first place? Why are we writing it here in class, other than torture? Things happen on the computer. Well, tell me more about that. <laughs> what if you didn't have a compiler? What would you have to do? This is all related to your question. Your question is extremely timely, based on this slide. Um, I would work to the same day, and or not even. If you wanted to write a pro, if you wanted to write a program for your uh, laptop which is you running an Intel architecture, right? Probably an Intel Core i5, yeah. Core i7, something like that. Um, but you're running Intel architecture. Um, if you wanted to write a program for your laptop and there was not a compiler 
available, what would you have to do? Then you have the right assembly. It's right assembly. Yeah. How many of you would want a full-time job writing assembly all day long? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I mean, it's just... It's fun. Saying. It's just making programming less efficient. Human beings like power tools, right? We've proven in here that we can write assembly, right? You had a homework assignment to write an assembly program, and that one wasn't horrible, right? But that didn't do very much. Like if I gave you that to write in Java, you would think that was like a joke assignment, right? Read two things in, what I say, add them together, and then spit out the result or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, add the, uh, no, loop through the bigger and the smaller number, right? Um, and print out the, the values. So if that was a Java homework assignment, you would say, okay, that doesn't seem like a Lippman assignment, right? Something's off. But for an assembly assignment, that was challenging enough. You got to, you got to experience the, uh, the MIPS assembly world and put yourself in the shoes of uh, somebody who might be writing that code for a living, right? So the problem a compiler solves for us is it allows us to use the power tool that is the high level programming language so that we don't have to write the low level assembly code. Because we don't want, you all laughed when I said, how many of you would want to spend your day writing assembly code? It's kind of cool to say you could, but it'd get old pretty quick, right? Like it's kind of fun, I, I think, to sit there and mess around with the architecture and kind of really feel like you're using your computer. You're talking to that CPU on a one-to-one -one basis. I'm speaking to the CPU, right? But if you're really talking about doing this eight hours a day, day in, day out, that's going to get a little old pretty quick, right? You're going you're gonna to feel like you're always solving very simple problems in a very, very long-winded way. <laughs> How good uh, a uh, computer scientist doing that, right? Uh, well, like, could you? Could a, a scientist, because he's trying to... Yeah. On that. Well, the answer is yes, because I mean, we've done it in here. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, that, that's the point. I mean, I realize that I mean, some of you found it various levels of interesting, but we did prove that we can do it. Right. And you might say, OK, I can deal with this for an eight week portion of a class. But I'm pretty convinced I don't want to do this for a living. And from the computer science perspective, we'd say, thank God we have compilers. Because some of you might say, look, I don't necessarily love programming either, but I'd rather write this in Java than this. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the problem compilers solve for us. They allow us to write the Java code, and then the compiler does the tedious work of converting that Java code into that assembly code so that we don't have to write the assembly directly. That's the problem compilers solve. And they're hard. I mean, we're writing, we're writing like a ghetto compiler here. And it's better than it should be because we're actually supporting stuff that the book is, you know, basically just assuming you would always have these two lines right next to each other. But you can imagine, like in the assignment, I said, we don't have to worry about optimized assembly code. Well, because if you're going to optimize your assembly code, that becomes a lot harder problem to solve. But optimizing assembly code, having an optimized compiler, was way, way, way more important 30 years ago, 40 years ago than it is today. That doesn't mean it's unimportant today because 1% of the time, let's say, probably less than that, but let's just say it's 1% of the time, you're gonna want optimized assembly code. You're gonna want your compiler to spit out efficient stuff. But 99% of the time, the most inefficient assembly code that is accurate is gonna feel like it runs just as quickly as the most optimized assembly code that's also accurate. That makes, makes some sense? We kind of see where compilers fit in our world? Yes. Um, I might have another question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that, this, is, the, this is like a, good, a really good discussion because it gives us an idea of why we're doing all this. Yeah, so, okay, so I understand that assembly is going to be able to understand what I read my compiler mm -hmm. for that specific processor. So how does this assembly 
It's how any other program that exists can is able to run in any other processor, not yeah. any other, but most ah, of the processors. I get what you're asking. Because that sounds a little. Yeah, I got it. So um, we're going to say we have Intel. We have MIPS. And we have the Lipman architecture. Actually, this would probably be the Mr. Gonzalez architecture. He likes to make it onto slides. Wow. We have ARM. All right. So, brand new, well, Mr. Gonzalez's architecture would be ARM based. Okay. Probably, but it's his own his own architecture. All right. So, these are actual CPU architectures. Each of these guys would have an assembly associated with them. A low level language that had a one-to-one -one relationship with the architecture itself. All right, now, what you're asking is, hey, I'm a C programmer. And I wanna write a C program and have that C program be able to run on this Intel processor. But I also want to write a C program and have that same program run on this MIPS processor. And I want to have that same program run on the Mr. Gonzalez uh, processor. All right. So we have a compiler here. Now, what does a compiler do? A compiler takes a high level language, like we're using, we have C input coming into our compiler, right? And it outputs for a architecture. It outputs in a low-level language. Now, the reason we are building our output lines here. Oh, where's my MIPS compiler? This guy. The reason why we're putting these very specific instructions here in our output string is because we are targeting this MIPS assembly. That's what our compiler currently outputs. That's it's, you know, our compiler only supports a single architecture. So we take C source code and turn it into MIPS assembly code. But nothing says that we can't write our compiler to support a different architecture. That we can't teach it how to support the low-level language that's associated with the Mr. Gonzalez CPU, or the low-level language that's associated with a Intel, you know, some modern rendition of the Intel architecture. You can have a single compiler. In fact, we have a, uh, the GCC, the GNU C compiler, knows how to target if I go out here to my terminal, and I'll just open a terminal here. And I do man GCC. All right, so here's the help thing for the GCC compiler. Scroll up a bunch. And one of the flags is going to let us tell it what architecture we want to target. Oh, yay, yay. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to pipe that to more. Okay, there we go. Um, well, it might be. Google. <laughs> 
GCC for um, PowerPC, something like that. Yeah, here, using the GNU compiler collection for PowerPC options. Give me the instruction. There's going to be like a dash arch. Um, yeah, I think it's just called dash dash arch and then you tell it the name of the architecture you're compiling for. Okay, yeah, here's an example. Yeah, so here's a, uh, there's a CC instruction that you can say I want to compile for the ARM Linux um, compiler for GCC. So this is specifically, I want outputted, uh, if you remember back near the beginning of the course, we looked at uh, Hello World and Assembly, right? And we saw that when you look at assembly code, it's actually written in two separate, with two th separate things in mind. One is the architecture, you know, so the, in this case, it's a, uh, an ARM architecture. And then the other thing is what operating system, because the output is going to have to know about the system calls for that operating system. When we looked at Hello World, it was only like this long. But the reality is, is underneath the hood, several of those system calls are going to turn into assembly that's whoosh, way, way, way longer. So even writing the assembly for Hello World, we were still using these power tools for like syswrite to write something out to the screen. That would have been hundreds of lines potentially of, um, potentially of assembly code. Um, but we can use a compiler collection like GCC to say, I want to take my C code and I want to target the ARM architecture for Linux, the Linux operating system. So this C code is written with Linux in mind, Linux's capabilities, and I want you to turn it into functional low-level code that will run on the ARM architecture, assuming that that chip is executing Linux. Make sense? So if we go back to our picture here, the GCC compiler is a famous compiler collection. It's the GNU compiler co collection. So this guy knows how to take a bunch of different input languages, C being the main one, let's say. Take C as an input language, but it can output for various assemblies for various operating systems in between. Correct, if we wanted it to run within a certain operating system, if we wanted this guy to produce an executable for a specific operating system. If we don't care about that, you know, this assembly can run directly on this Intel processor if we had some way of talking directly to the processor using an assembler. We could just have the processor execute the instructions. But that assembly would have to be written as native Intel assembly not related to any operating system. So if we're going to say this is not going to work for related to an operating system, we give up the, our right to use the power tools associated with that operating system. And instead, we're just writing native assembly. Keep in mind that somebody had to write the operating system, right? And they had to compile that operating system down to assembly code. Well, that assembly code for an operating system 
could not been could not have been written in terms of an operating system. So that means they had to write instructions that translate to all of the individual instructions that are necessary for that processor to accomplish a task that is very, very, very tedious that we're glad we didn't write the assembly for, but somebody at Microsoft or somebody who works on the Linux project maybe did have to write the assembly code for certain parts of the operating system to make it accomplish certain things. Because they're talking, I mean, the purpose of an operating system is to act as the bridge between the user and the hardware. So at some point there, the operating system is going to be talking to, talking zeros and ones. Oh, okay. Make sense? Yes, okay. okay. So it's got to talk to your graphics card and tell him in terms of zeros and ones to spit certain colors out in certain places. And that's going to get pretty tedious pretty fast. So if you were working at like Microsoft or something, people working on the OS code base, you might be writing, uh, especially for drivers, um, software drivers, you might be writing stuff down at the assembly level. Anymore, a lot of our modern operating systems have a, a abstraction layer that sits above that. So they actually have a driver subsystem. So now if you were working on Microsoft Windows driver subsystem, you might be an, uh, an assembly coder. But then if you were just writing drivers, let's say you worked for NVIDIA or something like that, you were writing a graphics card driver for Windows, you would write that in terms of the higher level language using the driver subsystem API. You know, so you would talk to that really complex subsystem in terms of the 10 or 12 things it knows how to do and solve all your problems that way. So maybe you're not quite at a high level language, maybe you're working at a medium level language or something. So at some point in time, we had to write stuff right for the CPU. So what do humans do? We like to build power tools. So some person locked themselves in a room and wrote some assembly code that solves some problem and then say, okay, well this works. So now you can write some code in terms of this guy, which knows how to talk right to the hardware. And then we took that, we abstracted it up another level, abstracted it up another level, abstracted it up another level to the point that we're writing Java code that compiles for a software computer called the Java Virtual Machine, which translates into a, uh, um, a hardware-based computer for a specific operating system. So if I'm on my machine, my Java uh, virtual machine is converting that into assembly code that runs for the Intel processor on the Macintosh operating system, ultimately turning into zeros and ones. So when I write my Java code, I'm a bunch of layers removed from that processor. Cool? Yeah, okay. All right. What's interesting is in our last hour, did we even make one line of code of progress? Mm -hmm. We talked about a lot of good stuff, but I don't think we made any lines of code of progress. All right, so then let's take five minutes and uh, we'll come back and we'll actually write some stuff for this other uh, part of it. So 8.28, let's say. So does that actually